Good evening, everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to have as our guest tonight, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Vincent Rondeau, uh, from Director of the Egyptian Department at the Louvre Museum since 2014. He's also member of the advisory board of the Museo Egizio. Um, he's a researcher at uh, CNRS since 1997. He has an enormous experience uh, in, uh, in the archaeology and history of Egypt. He lived for 10 years in Egypt. Uh, he's a member of the IFAO. Uh, he was already a member of the team in the Louvre Museum in charge of the reorganization of the Egyptian department between 1993 and 1997. He has been the director of the French archaeological unit in Khartoum from 2004 and to, uh, till 2009. Uh, he has a, an extensive experience as an epigraphist, an archaeologist, and his research concentrates on the cults to the god Amun, both in Sudan and Egypt, and on the cults of the crocodile god Sobek in the Fayum at the Greek or Roman times. Uh, the, the research and uh, about the divine iconography and the impact of Hellenism during the last centuries of paganism, both in Sudan and Egypt, is one of his main interests. He's also uh, a member as a director of the Egyptian Department of the Louvre, of the consortium that we have together, the Louvre, the British Museum, the Rijksmuseum van Houten, and the Neues Museum in Berlin and the Museo Egizio. Uh, we have been closely working together in the past few years in developing uh, a master plan for uh, the refurbishment of the museum in uh, Tahrir. So uh, I welcome you, uh, Vincent, and I'm very glad uh, to have you uh, among us today, even though I was really looking forward uh, to have you in presence, but uh, we are still in the aftermath of the pandemic and unfortunately, traveling is not uh, is not allowed yet. Uh, but we uh, we hope to have you in Turing soon. And the topic of his uh, lecture tonight uh, is about the organization of the cult of Amon in the island of Meroe, the heart of the Maritic Empire. It will uh, show us how the Hassa mission uh, has uh, been able to shed light on the topic of how the cult of Amon developed in Meroe. So, Vansan, I give you the floor. Merci, Christian. Thank you very much for your uh, welcoming words. And um, I will put the, the, my um, PowerPoint. I will share it with you. Uh, I hope this is the case now. Do you see it properly? Yes, perfect. So as a, a starting point for this lecture, that me too, I wish I could have done in, uh, in presence, but it is uh, the way it goes those days. Anyway, when I, as an introduction, when I started my work in, um, in Sudan, let's say year 2000 was uh, the beginning of uh, our, the work of our team, I couldn't uh, imagine at that time uh, that the question of the cults of Amun was such an open one, still such an open one, mainly in the case of the Meroitic Empire. Let's assume that uh, in the Napatan times, we will come to that issue soon, uh, the, the, the thing are a little bit settled, but for the Meroitic times, I was surprised to, to, to realize how, um, how to be developed it has to, to be. I don't know how to carry on the presentation. How does it work? Right. Yes. So uh, just to, 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 to remember for everybody that um, how it goes in, the, in this uh, uh, part of the valley, which is uh, uh, among the, the first cataract, we have traditionally uh, three kingdoms, one after the other, each one named after the, the capital 
of the, the, the kingdom, Kerma, Napata, and Mehoe. So you have with this with these, uh, very short slide all the, the comprehensive elements for the, with the dates. And uh, we have to remember that, when, let's say, when, when I started, not the work actually, but when I started my studies myself, um, when I was a student, it was not clear at all that we, we were talking about the, the evolution of the same nation, of the same Kushite kingdoms following each other. We still had the vision at that moment uh, when I was at the university that, for example, there was a, a big um, difference or gap uh, between the Napatid Kingdom and the Maritic Kingdom. Nowadays, the vision is much more of a continuum and uh, uh, with different expressions and different uh, uh, capitals or major cities anyway. Well, the, the better example that is that, for example, when Meroe becomes the capital of the, the heart of the empire, Napata is still a very important um, uh, uh, capital, uh, religious capital, and close to Kerma Dukigel, which um, comes out from, um, which is now a little bit known. Uh, Dukigel was also a very important um, city of the heartland. And one never has to forget that when we deal about the cults of Amun in the Kushite kingdoms, we have always to keep in mind the importance of the cult of Amun of Thebes in the cults of Amun in, uh, in uh, Sudan. We will show that with um, many details. Here is the map of the kingdom of uh, Mehoe with the, the main sites. And you will see that El Hassa, which will be uh, the, the main part of the, the lecture is um, a little bit south of uh, Mehoe city. <coughs> and necropolis in the a region which is called the Kiraba. And you, you, you see all the, the, the different uh, sites uh, around. A closer, with El Hassan Mouais, a closer map, and then an even closer one, which will show you, do you see my, um, my arrow? We will show you El Hassa here on the, the, on the river Nile. Yes, yes, we do see. Yeah. And you do see. And then the capital city here, Meroe, the royal necropolis, the three sides of the royal necropolises, and the, 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 the context of, of the landscape in a very moving Nile with those islands that move a lot on the, on the, on the river. There is something we, we have to, to, to think about when we consider archaeology in, in the Sudan the floods still exist. And this is one of the first surprise we have to, 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 to witness when we arrive in Sudan here. This is uh, the flood in year 2020. <clears throat> it was quite high. And uh, each time it is high, it really destroys a lot of villages and makes a lot of, um, um, how would you say in English, of uh, problems with, you know, killing cattle and so you, you understand that um, the, the, the problems of the, the flood can be very vivid. And also we have to visit the other face, face of the, the digging house, you know, the main entrance of the digging house we, we built in, um, in El Hassa to be, to be, on the, to be able to, to work properly. Anyway, there is another thing we have to think about is that contrary to Egypt, the Sahel landscape do not rely on the Nile as much as it does in Egypt. You, you can harvest crops, you know, 80 kilometers away from the Nile in what looks to us a desert, which, but which is not at all. It is a Sahelian landscape with um, a season for rain, which gives a lot of uh, possibilities to um, storage the water and to live on it for months, uh, mainly through this um, technical uh, mean, which is what they call a hafir. And you see one here. These mounds over there are not natural. 
this is handmade. This is all the ground that has been uh, uh, dragged out from the, the hafir itself. And you, you can see this one at the end of the, the, the this is really the end of the, the water inside of it. Uh, the, it evaporated and the cattle and the people have drank it for months after the flood season, after the rain season, sorry. When I <clears throat> took that picture, these two camel drivers were coming to the Afir and first they had their camel drinking and then they drank from the same uh, water uh, reservoir. Another point where <clears throat> the Dura, Sorghum, which is really, we will see that on the, the Sorghum is a, the, the, the base for, the, for the, the eating, you know. And here the, the photo is taken on a Neolithic um, grinding uh, stone. Um, the two elements, you know, that was found in a Neolithic uh, tomb. And to not not far from El Hassa in El Kadada by Jacques Reynold during his last uh, dig. So the story of the, the site of the region of Meroe is linked to uh, three travelers. You know, we 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 always uh, mention their names because they are really the ones at the origin of our uh rediscovery literally speaking at the beginning of the 20 of uh, the 19th century the rediscovery of what was thought to be almost um mythical you know since trouble uh in europe at that time miroe was kind of a mythic land you know completely unknown and disappeared from the memories so burkhardt after um, going to petra rediscovering the being the first to rediscover Petra, to rediscover Abu Simbel, was one of the first to um, to come to Bigrawiya to Meroe, and he was he is one of, he is the first to mention El Hassa on the 18th of May 1814, and then we 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 have to mention Lino de Belfond uh, some uh, eight years later. And uh, the first to mention, he is the first to mention the presence of a sphinx, a buried sphinx. We will see what he, he means by this term. Caillou, a few days later, talks also about a sphinx billy, a sphinx billy this time. So he precises that it is not a sphinx, that means the body of a lion with the head of a human or a ram, but it is the complete statue of a ram. Aussi en grès et de style égyptien. <clears throat> Here is in the archives of the Louvre Museum, the, the, the page with the map by uh, Lino de Belfond, he's mapping the, the River Nile with the mention he, he makes of uh, Begrawiya, you know, with pyramid three times, you can see the words pyramid here, here, and here, mentioning Bigrawiya West, Bigrawiya South, and Bigrawiya North. And also El Hassa Decombre SP, SP. We have to complete it by Sphinx. So he notes, you know, what he observes. He draws the, 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 the Nile Valley and uh, notes, this is of course a very precious document. And uh, when I was saying that I was uh, not aware of how the cult of, the question of the cult of Amun is something still very open. One of the reasons is uh, simply, I should say, I would say because because of the better preservation, uh, far away from the from the River Nile, there are something like uh, thirty-five kilometers away from the Nile. The sites of uh, Naga and uh, Musawarat, well preserved, very well preserved. Uh, let's say, let, let's put it this way: take all the place, you know, they they in our representation of things. 
they are they take they, they, they in, in a way if I, if I may put it the way this way they <clears throat> they have um, predominance that prevent us to understand the the other sites uh, in the Nile Valley and of course the site of Meroe the Meroe, Meroe city and uh, is also in the in the same situation. For example, to, 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 to mention these monuments, the Lion Temple of Musawara, which has been completely rebuilt by the German mission from the Humboldt University working there in the years 68 and 69, is one of the most impressive monuments uh, and complete that we can see uh, in, uh, in, this, in this site. And uh, it is quite ancient. It is uh, in the name of the King Archimani, and we, we are talking about the, the second century BC. So uh, we have very valuable old inform ancient information on the call to the lion god of Meroe, Apedemak. Or again, in the Naga lion temple, the same, uh, same uh, thing, you know, we have a, uh, a very important amount of scenes and uh, data and documents which um, uh, shed us a, a, a very important light on the cult of Apedemak and then contribute to, um, to shed again uh, sometimes too much light. Here the, the, the drawing of Linan de Belfond uh, of the, 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 the pylon uh, representing the Kore uh, smiting the enemies. Because the, the question of the cult of Apedemak um, uh, also is quite open, I would say, like the one of Amun. And uh, the best example I can show this situation is that the stila you see on the right, which gives for the first time the name of this goddess, the, fal the goddess with the falcon, or the black goddess as we call her in the, the previous um, publication. For the first time, we have her name here, which is Amesemi. And she's represented here, embracing the famous uh, Candace uh, uh, Amanitore, uh, the mother of the King Natakamani, who reigned at the, at the middle of the first century AD. This Tila giving for the first time the name of the goddess the Paredra of uh, Apedemak, Amesemi, was dis discovered in the Amun Temple of Naga in 1999 only, before we didn't know the name of the Paredra of Apedemak. So when we started uh, our work, it's very easy to, to, to present what was at hand to know about the site we would work on it because it was uh, very easy to gather the documents uh, pertaining to the same king uh, as on these two rams. You see that ram here found in El Hassa by accident in 1975 while digging a small canal, which with the inscription of the basis gave the comparison with that previous ram known from 1850, but in Soba, which is south of Khartoum, some 200 kilometers south of El Hassa. So it was one of the first um, questions to solve since the beginning. How do we consider that these two ram statues in the name of the same king do belong to the same monument? or do they belong to two different monuments of, this, of the same king? Uh, in 1916, in Jebel Barkal was found this, um, we call it uh, the Omphalos, which is a very improper denomination. This um, Naos, it is uh, nothing more than a Naos in a Kushite uh, format, which is in the name of the same king. And in 19... 
saw for the first time in the Meretic Cursive the name of the same king. It had an important consequence because um, while studying with, with, uh, through the cursive royal inscription and trying to see how he could organize them uh, according to the evolution of the, this cursive, you know, the paleography of it, Claude Rilly understood that the date of the, that king, Amanahrekerema, was not 200 AD like it was proposed very vaguely, but much more something like 1890 AD. That means 100 years earlier in the history of the Meritic kings, which makes a lot of difference. And we, we shall comment this uh, further. We started our dig. It was in 19, uh, in, no, no, in uh, 2002, 2002. And we had the chance for the first campaign to find that ram statue in the name of the king. You can see it uh, lying and uh, close to its basis. Here is the base for the, this ram statue with the inscription, the same inscription as on Soba's ram and the, the ram found in 1975. So <clears throat> the, the, the um, the things were progressing. We had two rams coming from the same site, one found in 1975, the other one in uh, 2002. The only problem, if I may put it this way, is that they were very different, very much different in size, which is in itself quite odd. One uh, assumed that the, the statues of the, the same um, uh, Dromos or a sacred causeway should be or could be at the same size. So that was one of the, the first uh, question that we added while digging. In the same, uh, at the same moment, the Berlin Museum and uh, uh, Dietrich Wildung uh, with uh, Carla Kröper were, were working in uh, Naga, in the Amun Temple, and they were digging um, a small building uh, perpendicular to the dromos of the Amun Temple, which appeared to be in the, in the name of the same king, Nematre Amanaha Rekerema. And here you can see with these uh, stones, uh, the, the, the beauty of the, of the relief that decorated this, um, this uh, small monument. So, uh, at the same moment, while, while we were working in El Hassa and our colleagues from Berlin working in Naga, many things were gathered, new elements, new data about the, the cult of this king. And after the question of the size of the rams, we had another question with the foundations of the monuments we were unearthing. You can see here the position of the ram found in 2002. And then we progressed, we had the pylon and then we had the, the, the different rooms, where one after the other. It was a kind of a systematic, uh, you know, exploitation of the, of the monument. It was quite uh, easy to anticipate uh, what would be the next campaign, you know. But what was not easy to anticipate is the, the, this question that we couldn't, for quite a while, couldn't answer properly. The, the green color that you see shows the, the foundation we uh, isolated in the, in the ground. And the actual position of the walls that were above this foundation in that, in that two rows in that section, two rows of rooms, uh, not mentioning that one for the moment you will see later. Anyway, we couldn't understand why that um, orange walls, for example, were not on the foundation, but out of them. And these two walls were half on the foundation only. That was so strange. 
And to justify, to, 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 to explain these uh, architectonic abnormalities, we, we had to understand the following. A previous temple of which you have the plan here has been first built and then reused while being modified for the second, a second phase. So let's call this uh, first plan, first monument phase one, and then we can compare it, go back to the, to the, uh, the um, now so uh, found in the Jebel Barkal, because look here, these are the foundation of the Naos in the first version of the temple, in phase one temple. It is a circular uh, foundation hole, very easy to recognize with the digging, very clearly uh, drawn with the difference of the color of the sand inside and, uh, and the ground outside. And of course, comes to, to us immediately the shape, this round shape of the so-called Omphalos of Napata, this uh, naos of a, a temple, a Kushite uh, naos in a round shape like that one. And for the, this tripartite uh, plan of the monument, you know, is when our first row of room, second row and third row where is the sanctuary, Muwais, uh, where the Louvre started a dig in uh, 2007, uh, under the direction of uh, Michel Beau, uh, was unearthing uh, at the same moment uh, a monument of the same shape, you know, with this, this rhythm of three rows of um, series of rooms. There were unearthing uh, elements of the decoration of the same building in the name of Amani Torre, uh, Natakamani and Amani Torre, the same, um, the same uh, king as um, famous kings in the, of the beginning of the first century AD. And they were even finding elements of uh, the fleece of ram statues which uh, you will see are, uh, and will be important for, for our understanding of these uh, question of the, um, the dromoi uh, of the temples in the region. So this temple in phase one, reused for another, a second phase temple, which is as follow. So you can see that the, the, they are yellow now, but the, the, the walls, this room is enlarged. That was a century before. They had a fourth series of three rooms with a new sanctuary. This time, the new sanctuary has a square a section for the house. It's not anymore a round one, Kushite one. It's a square one. And they need to enlarge these two uh, rooms. They add these columns they completely transform the building. They enlarge, enlarge it, and it gives a comprehensive uh, plan as it is. Um, we understood progressively on many arguments, I will not develop all of them, that the, one of the reasons they decided to do all that work, to, to, to restart completely the thinking of the, the, the rooms of the, 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 the cult and everything, to our understanding, one of the reasons is that they wanted this temple to look more pharaonic, if I may put it this way, to look more Egyptian. That, not meaning that they wanted to be more Egyptian, but they wanted to be, this is how I, I, I understand it, they wanted to be closer to the, uh, um, the model, closer to the, um, the true, uh, um, how do you say, the, um, the origins, you know, the origins of the Amun cults, which are obviously in Egypt. And so the, the, the aim of all these transformation of the building was to rethink the Amun temple in a way that it looks more pharaonic, more closer to the model. 
we can say some words about the decoration of the temple because we found a lot of these fragments of uh, grinded um, uh, ochre, yellow, red, blue color, white, black, and fragments of uh, shirts, you know, shirts of uh, pots obviously used as at this one to, to melt, the, the, to prepare the, the, the painting, the paint. And it was uh, quite interesting to see that the Mirrorites developed a very elaborate technique of a strong, very strong mortar uh, carved or molded or fascinated, still fresh to, to be sculptured for, for scenes, you know, to, to, to implement the, the decoration and then painted while uh, dry or painted also with the technique of affresco. Uh, this is uh, one thing that uh, uh, Serge Fenet and uh, his uh, colleagues studied uh, in, the, in the frame of the, of the dig to demonstrate that the technique used was affresco, uh, which is quite um, an information, I would say, in, the, in this uh, uh, comprehension of the different traditions used uh, in the Nile Valley. Is it something taken from, uh, from Rome at a moment or another? It is a possibility. Anyway, here we have the, the, the face of uh, one of the royals, it, him being the, the, the Kore, Amanah Harikerem, or the Kandas. You will see what I, well, why I say that immediately, because we found that <clears throat> Uh, element of a wall, and we understood uh, rapidly that it represented the hips, the large hips of the fat kandas holding a sorghum um, uh, in the, her hand. We undertook a restoration of the of this. Uh, surprising element of the decoration. And um, while restoring it, we were able to understand how it was painted. And uh, interestingly enough, we understood that there were two stages, stages in the uh, colors chosen. They, they were done one first time with that decoration of the, the dress of the Candace to be replaced in the phase two by this, um, yellow uh, painting. So the, the decoration uh, accordingly to the evolution of the architecture of the building itself. And you can see, of course, here, what I was meaning, the, the heaps of the candas. This is the part that we have on this uh, wall. And of course, the hand is down like that with the sorghum in that hand on the, along the body. <clears throat> this is taken from a, a Naga temple, lion temple. Uh, we go back to 2005 and the uh, discovery that we made in the sanctuary, we sometimes uh, with enthusiasm, we call it a treasure. It's perhaps a little bit over the top, but the cash actually, this is for sure. And uh, you can see with um, on this uh, inside this circle, and you can see here fallen bricks still in connection. They have not been disturbed since they have fallen down. And you can see here that this brick, like the others, is also thin. And with these um, rays, which are done when, they, when the, 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 the ground is still fresh before baking the brick, before firing it, so that the, the, this technique is used when you want to build, to, to make bricks for vaults. It means it means very easily that the sanctuary 
of this temple here was vaulted. And here is the altar that you can see here under the uh, collapsed vault. We understood that <coughs> the, 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 the premises were, uh, we had an appointment with an important, um, uh, let's say, discovery. Uh, when we found these first fragments of a, um, a plate with, you know, a nice decoration on its, uh, on its rim like that, of uh, some like looking like Pampre de Vigne. And we understood that the, the, the plate was complete. It was not only shirts, you know, it was a complete uh, object. And we understood rapidly that this object was the container for these objects to come with uh, this uh, st statue of uh, Isis Lactance, this Neolithic um, mace and um, axe and this small statuette with hieroglyphs, as you may see. We shall say some words on it. Here is the um, Isis Lactance um, uh, statuette. Uh, one point important to, to notice now. The, f through the style, and so we can understand that this um, easy statuette is Ptolemaic. That means that it is something like four, let's say four centuries before the cash. So this object is very old when it, it is um, included in the object that will be hidden in the, in the, the, the basis for the nows. And uh, it has been hidden while already broken, as you may see the object. So it, it was cultic object, but in a, in a kind of a <coughs> poor state of preservation. So 2005, we find the torso and 2006, we find the, the heaps of the, of the statue. We make the facsimile, these are Egyptian hieroglyphs. So the, the, the tra translation is, is easy. And as you may see, it talks about Amun-Ra and Mood, the great mistress of the Ishero. That means Amun of Thebes and uh, his consort, Mood of the Ishero. So, you know, when I said to you that we never have to forget that Theban cults are part of the Meroitic cult in the island of Meroe, we have here um, a very vivid demonstration. <coughs> Look, for example, in uh, Naga again, uh, when you, you consider the main gate and the, the, the lintel, the, the pylon on the two sides, the first pylon, and uh, you see the lintel, the gods represented are Amun of Naga with a ram head on one side, and Amun of Thebes, with his classical uh, human head, head on the other side. The sanctuary is shared by the two Amuns, the one of Naga and the one of Thebes. And this is a rule in all the temples of the region. Another example of one of the objects that were hidden in this cache inside this uh, faience bowl this faience uh, pectoral, almost complete. Claude Rilly told her that, unfortunately, these meritic inscriptions do not give us the name of the god, but only, uh, you know, votive uh, formulas. So we only have the iconography, but the iconography is very original, since it, re it represents um, Amun Ram, headed god, but uh, Luna Amun, because he has uh, the, the Luna uh, disc as a crown. And he, offer, he offers, obviously, to the king a crown also with a Luna disc on its top, which is a very original iconography. We, we cannot say if this is the Amun of Elasa, it is impossible. 
but uh, that could be an hypothesis. The object in itself is interesting because we understand you know, they, on the back there are these R sign and they are, per, uh, they, are um, they have holes here which go like this, which are tra transversing and they were obviously uh, augmented with um, fabrics and um, ropes and uh, so it was a, a complete jewel, you know, for the uh, use for the cult. And um, another fact which was quite striking is wh while, so here is the, the, these bases for the notes in which we found the cache. When we reached the, the, the ancient floor of the sanctuary, we were surprised, really surprised to see a last offering still in situ look at this uh, stone with this uh, place here, reserved place with a bowl in it, broken by the collapsing of the vault. Look at this uh, libation uh, or table in um, ceramic. In, um, and these ob this object, which is actually a Neolithic ax, a very beautiful one. Obviously, the only solution is to understand that it was dug in the tombs of a, uh, in a Neolithic tomb, you know, some, some 5,000 years BC by those people, let's say in year 400 AD, to use it uh, in the cult as a, as a ritual object for the cult. By the way, this is a, uh, the, the uh, pectoral I just showed you with the lunar amun on it. And what is striking is that this is a rule that we find these sanctuaries with a last uh, offering in them. This is a condition in which the, our German colleague found the naus of, a, of a Naga, and this is the condition in which Garstang found uh, the sanctuary of the Meroe Temple of Amun in uh, 1999, if I remember well. He, he's the one who, uh, the, this um, libation uh, table was there. Another pleasure of the discoveries was this uh, small bust. And, um, the possibility we had to, to, to bring it back to France and to have it restored through a sponsoring from um, EDF Valectra. It's a pleasure to, to, to thank them again for their uh, enthousi enthusiasm and comprehension because the result of this restoration was that, that we, we, we found a very nice uh, bust of a queen, obviously. Uh, the, the, the object, as you see, it is complete. It is not a, a broken statue or what. And um, one has to understand that it is, there is a hole here to allow probably the, the, this object to be on the, on the submit of a pole, you know, to, for, for sacred, uh, sacred um, how would you call it, emblema or I don't know. And it represents uh, most probably uh, a condas with, um, uh, you know, room for two uh, earrings and so on. So we can imagine a, a quite striking object uh, representing the, the mother of the king. Time has come that we can compare now our results with uh, Naga, because as I told you, Naga is, uh, is one of our most uh, easy representation of a Namun temple in the island of Meroe. This is a fact. But it is also for us a very useful um, tool uh, to have a comparison elements uh, to understand what is much more broken in El Hasa and much more 
well preserved in uh, Naga. So we can we can compare easily and see that we have the, uh, they, they are not at scale uh, the two the two monuments. They are, they are almost the same size the, the building proper. Anyway, a big monumental altar at the entrance of the sacred causeway. And interestingly enough, it is not on the axis of the temple, but slightly on the side, most probably not to uh, prevent, uh, the, the, um, not to um, interfere with the, the, the ceremonials. Then a ramp, which is here mixed with ram statues. Here, the ram statues are only after the ramp. Then a kiosk, then ram statues again. Then the temple, four series of room, again, like four series of room in El Hassa, uh, a plan which is uh, slightly different, but this is not the point now. And so that was one of the very interesting um, data that we got. Also, a back chapel with a statue of a ram for the, the cult in a Contra temple. We thought that it was only the case in uh, Naga, but we have to understand that it, it was more uh, shared than uh, thought before. What is striking in El Hassa is that the, the um, dromos and the, the, the repartition of the ram statues uh, on one side and the other of the kiosk are asymmetrical. This is striking in itself. And you will see that uh, we have the explanation for why the, the, the ram found in 1975 is smaller than the one found in uh, 1902, which was here, because these ram statues are bigger than the one on the ramp. That's it. We had the explanation. And here is an um, overview. Uh, it was before the invention of the drone, you know, so or the democratization at, uh, of the drone. So we, we, we had to use a kite. It was uh, complicated, but we, we could get that plan, which shows three of the ram statues, you know, that we found. And also one here, but we will, uh, we will show you photos. And on, also on that uh, view, we see uh, the, the appearing um, in, the, in the blue circle, a monument, a building that we want to we wanted to know more about it here, which is after the end of the league. It is, as you can see, very destroyed, very much destroyed. It is rare than when we are above the foundation. For example, all the all these walls are under the foundation, here above, here with the staircase above here a little bit, and here also a little bit. So it was difficult to, um, to get a proper map, but you will see that we, we managed to, to, to grasp many information uh, on that building, which is obviously a ceremonial palace linked to the temple, to function with the temple, to be part of the rituals of the temple. This is the way it goes in the phase one, which we were able to reconstruct. So this temple with the, this series of three uh, rows of room, with already this asymmetrical dromos and with a small altar at its entrance. A building over there, we don't know much about it. And then the ceremonial palace, with here obviously a very important place inside the, 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 the monument. And this is here um, a light well, you know, a feature very common to the Meritic um, uh, palaces. After uh, the reusing and transformation of that uh, building, here what we, we get in phase two. 
So the Amun temple has been transformed, enlarged, but also the ceremonial palace. Look at these small details here in red ochre that show how this um, podium, this kind of podium has been hidden by small walls added in this uh, phase two, which is really in itself an important um, data, you know, these two elements. This is, uh, and you know, hiding, closing um, uh, doors and, uh, and so on. And building the, uh, the, a big monumental altar replacing the small one of phase one. And this temple existed for a long while and then was probably abandoned or perhaps a victim of an earthquake, earthquake or something like that. We, we still debate a lot on this um, element. Anyway, it was re extensively rebuilt uh, in a third phase, phase uh, three, but rebuilt in a very poor condition. All what you see, these uh, red uh, walls uh, rebuilt are very poorly rebuilt. And interestingly enough, to rebuild the temple, they use the bricks of the ceremonial palace, which is completely abandoned at that moment to the point that there is a wall Am I too long? No. So, and here the name, the name of the of the king Amanachare uh, Kerema, on the front of the given life forever on the on the front of the base statue. So a lot of information given by the. Uh, I, you are trying to tell me something? The, the question of the, the question of the realm of Soba is a very complicated one. And I will uh, present it in a very, uh, very quick, uh, I will try to be, because I understand that I am at the end of the time. So, in uh, uh, 1848, he visited Soba and made this drawing of Soba's ram on its pedestal, which means the conclusion is that there is a Meroitic temple to Amun in Soba, which is a Christian capital of a Christian kingdom south of Khartoum. And um, since we know that uh, Soba's ram, is it? Do I have to stop, uh, Christian? No, no, no. You, no, you, you can go. You're, you're back online. Sorry. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I was. Um, okay. So I go back to the. These, these plates he published in, uh, in, uh, say, parallel des édifices, des édifices anciens, is very disturbing because it is a proof of uh, a Meroitic temple in Soba. This is REM Repertoire d'Epigraphie Meroitic, this one, 0001 by Griffiths, because he started his description of the Meroitic inscriptions 
by the most uh, thousand one, the one in Soba. So we are talking about the first uh, Hem inscription of the uh, Merovingian Empire. And we wanted to make sure that could we speak about a temple to Amun in Soba in the name of the same king? Or do we have to make an hypothesis that this ram in Soba has been transported from El Hassa to Soba in Christian time, which was already an hypothesis uh, made by my predecessors. Look at this uh, drawing by Tremo of the Naga Temple and the Dromos of Naga Temple. You recognize the kiosk here? Can you, can you see it? The kiosk and the pylon and the basis for the ram statues here and here and the ramp over here. And here we have this drawing of a, of a ram, but it is upside down. And look at what it gives when you, you have it. And of course you recognize um, the ram pretendly um, pre from Soba. This is, um, it was common at that time to arrange a reality, you know, to not to make fake exactly, but to, that was so difficult to get uh, the data that when you come back to France, you to, to be able to print the book, you, you do not hesitate. But we have to go back to Giovanni Miani, the Venetian that uh, lost his life seeking for the um, sources of the Nile. In a, he, he died in Mombutu and uh, his uh, diary and everything was bring back was brought back to Europe by, uh, by people who knew him there. And I was very struck when I visited an exhibition in uh, Venice a few years ago to see in one of the showcases that very drawing representing, we recognize it immediately, the Ram of Soba, with the proper, a, a quite good uh, copy of the inscriptions by Miani. And uh, so we have here Soba's Ram, and I would consider this as the first, dating back to 1861, the first ever uh, proper documentation of Soba's Ram, uh, and not the Trebos, Tremos one. Because, you know, there are two kinds of uh, rams. Rams with uh, fleece-like, fish scale, I would say. This is a case in El Hassa, this is a case in Dangel, for example. And the one with uh, snail uh, fleece, like in Naga, like in Meroe city, like in Mues. So we do not understand yet why we have these two iconographic tradition. We have to find the proper explanation for this uh, situation. Anyway, we can observe it for the time being. And look, by the way, at the color they have been reconstructed by uh, my colleague, uh, Julie Anderson, and you see how they were painted, Naga's Ram, uh, Dangel Rams. So here are the drawings and the typology of the one we found in uh, El Hassa. And a kind of a history of the models, which go back to Taharka, the, the Amun temples in Kawa with uh, these uh, famous rams with the fleece also in a few scales, the model of which has to be searched in the rams of Soleb which have been, uh, which are dated back to Amenhotep III, of course. This one is in the Agriptitious Museum in Berlin. And which have been transported under the reign of Pianchi from Solem to Jebel Barkal. So this is the conclusion, you know, we have big rams here, small rams here on the ramp, smaller rams, these three rams, we found them, and we know from the orientation on the text, on the basis, that a ram is obviously on the north side, on this or the south side. It can, it's very easy to, to, to separate them. And so for Soba's ram, there is only one location possible, to, which is here. 
And so we, we, we have the demonstration, you know, the, what was an hypothesis, so Baslam transported in uh, Christian times from El Hassa to uh, Soba, uh, the capital of the Alwa kingdom, becomes a certainty. Let's go back to site management now and coming to, to the end of the lecture. Time was uh, ready to, to see how we, sh we, we could do something. Thanks to um, a grant from the uh, Qatari Sudanese uh, uh, QSAP program, Qatar Sudan Archaeological Project. Uh, this financing um, allowed us to, to be ambitious and to, to um, uh, think about site management, which is not easy when ev everybody knows that uh, in our conditions. First of all, the restoration of that ram, very dangerously cracked here and like this. So we, we see our colleagues from Restorierung am Oberbaum, here and here, Han, Jan and um, uh, Haman, and uh, our colleagues uh, from the Sudanese Antiquity Service, and myself, and we were in 2011, see, seeing how we could, um, we could uh, deal with that. And so we had the possibility to um, restore extensively those uh, statues and to, to, so that we can, they can stay in the, in the uh, outside in the air and be presented in the open air without any risks uh, for their conservation. So they are waiting, I, I, I like that photo anyway. We had to build a magazine to, to, to store them while we were uh, doing the, 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 the new modern uh, basis on which we, we would present the, the statues. So before, because one of the decisions was to recover completely our dig. Uh, again, there is a um, rain season in, uh, in that region of Sudan. It is very <clears throat> powerful, very heavy. And we, we could see one year after the other how rapidly the, the remains of the Amun temple were completely melting, you know, disappearing progressively. And we couldn't let things uh, happen this way. So we decided to recover completely. And before we recover, to, uh, to build the foundation for this basis. We recovered with um, with the proper uh, means, and then you see the dig on the top, and then after recovering, we, all uh, all is gone. And then we could build the uh, exterior part for the bases with good uh, solid uh, uh, parpaing. We say in French. Uh, which are uh, which were available at that moment that were very facilitating taking us the work. And here you can see the, the base is waiting for the statues. We were authorized to bring the Sobas Ram to El Hassa, so we are able to cast it. kicked out at uh, the very end um, but after I saw that the cast were uh, bringing us in such a, a wonderful journey uh, to Sudan and I have phase one and, and phase two and then the late phase three of the temple and uh, as you show the foundation change from a, a circular one do you think that the passage between phase maybe uh, either are more beside the change of architecture that the ending that would be a question of um, uh, empire and in Egypt taken many of their information from taken from Philae uh, and also for example we have another follow uh, scenes you know in uh, informed 
if I may say, organized delegations uh, of priests. Things. Thank you. And there are also of, on the reproposition of classic Egyptian themes and images. Were they somehow re-elaborated locally? <clears throat> Obviously, they are re-elaborated, but what I am convinced of and then in Meroe is to to racist means pharaonic because uh, we know that the, the, the I'm close to the the canonical uh, elements of the cult is one of the aims to time efforts are made through the will of the king, a special king, you know, what efforts are made. For example, when uh, Pionchi in uh, Napaton times, beginning of Napaton times, decides, decides to have the, the, it is not to decorate the temple, you know, it is literally to, to make it function very, you don't have your microphone. Sorry. Don't you think that sometimes uh, what uh, the Imir Perhej of uh, Taharka, uh, Ramosa does in his test, cosmographic test, but in a way the, that an Egyptian, the new kingdom would not use that in the sense... It can go, it can go up to, the, to, to such a point. The, the, um, at certain times, you know, it is a long time that um, the Egyptian conquest of the new, new kingdom has... Uh, Ancientness of the current concept is more ancient than uh, So thank you for your interest and important talk. You mentioned like sorghum, and both were known and used in Egypt or only in the Sudan. The, um, the, 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 the type of wheat that you can make with me. Many times we, we, uh, we see that represents the plant and make us understand its importance. Message from you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rondo, for the, the dismantling of the ceremonial palace. <laughs> this is one of the most difficult things to, to, to use on the date of it. Uh, phase one and both phases. It, it is a very... Um, uh, possible. And so the collapsing, the length of the rune, and then the rebuilding will, will um, to, to answer that question. But you know, ceramics will give clues in. Um, well, a kind of appetizer because we, we, we will invite you to be in Turing. This lunar uh, uh, crown Absolutely. is I'm the form of, uh, and tell us more about uh, your wonderful work in the Sudan. So thank you for much for, You're welcome. for being with us. Thank you. Bye bye.